The search began in earnest soon after eight. It was the following morning and the thermometer attached to the wall outside the hotel entrance sat at a cool minus 16 degrees Celsius. There was no snowfall. Damien's absence had been noticed several hours earlier and Brett, Matthew and Severin and her customer had tried every possible way of finding him on their own before raising the alarm on a large scale. Also, only within the last half hour had it been getting light enough to make use of the Rettungsflugwacht helicopter, which was now ready for takeoff from the helipad at the district hospital in Ilans. During the night, the temperature had fallen to 24 degrees below zero, a point at which the human body is capable of surviving for a few hours, but not without sustaining permanent injury. Brett was calm. In his head, he went through it over and over again, while stealing his nerves in anticipation of the moment when he might, either by himself or guided by one of the other people assisting in the search, come upon the frozen body of his son. Damien might just be alive still, he might still be breathing, he may lose a leg or a foot or some of his toes, but still he might be alive and not lost, not necessarily. So. Brett remained calm. He had been traumatized from the outset into a methodical procedure which involved taking precisely one accurate step at a time. By the time the helicopter noisily took off, Brett had gone inside and sat down on a molded plastic chair which was fixed to the pristine linoleum floor. He covered his face with his hands, feeling sick to the core. When he looked up again, his vision was so blurred, he could only make out vague shapes as the tentative morning light cast a grey pall over the empty corridor through scratched wide window panes. His eyes were lost for focus, more so still was his mind. Matthew, who had sat down next to him one seat removed, suddenly felt a great surge of sorrow. Up until now, it had been worry and fear for his friend that had clasped his heart. Now this grip loosened and what followed was sorrow. Sorrow for the pain this man went through. Sorrow for Caroline whose life had expired. Sorrow for the boy he loved more than anybody else in the world but who he knew, felt, could not be happy. Never would be. If that was, and this thought physically shook him, he was still alive. Matthew stretched out his hand and touched Brett's, a kind touch of profound sorrow. His young palm was cool and wet against Brett's warm, dry hand. Brett felt so sick. He wanted to go home. He wanted to find the nearest international airport and fly home. Fly home quickly and say farewell to Caroline. Make sure everything was all right. Prepare for her funeral. A shiver gripped him and he remembered that Matthew was holding his hand, so he looked up at him and managed to smile. Matthew felt great admiration for this man, great sorrow too, yes, and almost a degree of jealousy. Damien was so loved by his father, so loved by everybody. The world was set in motion for Damien. When Damien disappeared, everybody would take part in the search. So would he, Matthew. Matthew thought about himself as he was looking at Brett and thought about Damien and thought about what it was like to love an angel. For surely that was what Damien was in reality, an untouchable, inapproachable, incomparable angel who was always benign and always out of reach, always always out of reach, particularly now, particularly now that they were all looking for him, Damien was completely out of reach and Matthew's sorrow was the greater for this. Her customer arrived in the glass-walled corridor with two plastic cups of coffee. He handed one of each, one of each of them to each of them and stood by the wide double doors that led onto the roof and helipad. Without taking his eyes off the white painted circle and H on the concrete floor, he said, they will find him, Mr. Fitzgerald. Don't worry. They will find him.